Uncivilized Poems by Christopher Warren Read by the author This book is non-copyright 2023, no rights reserved. To the extent possible under law, Christopher Warren has waived all copyright and related or neighboring works to Uncivilized, including all poems and this audio recording. This publication may be reproduced in part or in full, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, electronic, mechanical, photocopying, recording, or otherwise, without prior written permission from the publisher or yours truly. For detailed license information on Creative Commons Zero in the public domain, please visit creativecommons.org. And if you wish to support the artist, please visit thelurkingpress.com. My Room This is my room with the concrete floor and the TV by the door. There's a blanket to sleep on and a cup of tea and lots of ennui. Come on in. You tell me your secret. I'll promise to keep it. Hold your ear close and I'll tell you a few of mine. I've got nothing but time. Phone call. Hello. This is you from the future calling. I'm calling to tell you everything will be all right, but only if you listen to me. Your life is going to be a disaster. You will lose everything you thought was important. Things that look promising will turn out to be dead ends. The world you believe in is fake. Everything is worse than you thought it was. Life as you know it will disintegrate and slide between your fingers. You will become unrecognizable to everyone and everything. The people you call your friends are looking to murder you. The people closest to you will turn on you. You will be hated by everyone, humiliated, thrown out. The pain will be unimaginable. You will have days where the thought will enter your mind that it isn't worth living anymore. Your being, body, mind, and soul will be lost in moments of unimaginable agony beyond your wildest nightmares. It will be like crawling through the desert, your guts hanging out of your chest, sand embedded beneath your eyelids, scraping against your corneas with every blink. You will think you have the answers, and then realize you're wrong again. You will believe you have discovered what is right, but you've only returned to somewhere worse than where you started. Your sickness will be so vile, and inside you will find yourself in the wastelands of your imagination, where your soul will wander, crying out, My words for you now will never be enough to prepare you for the pain. You will fall. It is mandatory. But in your pain, you will wander until you reach the edge of darkness, and you'll fall off. And before you have any chance to come crashing down, you'll realize that you've always been able to fly, though everyone tried to tell you otherwise. And you will fly, and life will become something different for you. Almost no one will understand it. They are living the way you were, and most of them will always live that way. But those who do not hate you will see you flying, and a few will realize the great truth, and they will take off with you all moving to the same place. And everything you've ever been afraid of will die, 
and every nightmare you've ever had will be forgotten, and every dream you've ever dreamed will be nothing compared to the new nature of your life. And one day, you'll pick up the phone and make a call, and you will know these words in your heart, and you will say it exactly like this. Click. The Garden Mom and Dad were in the garden. They didn't need a thing. Every day they'd wander out into the woods. Dad would slay the beast, and Mom would gather berries and talk the bees out of their sweet honey. By evening they'd have a roaring fire, and before bed their bellies would be full, and whenever it stormed they'd be fast asleep or dancing out in the rain and there wasn't any snow, and the sun never scorched, and they had everything they needed. And every day was just the same, but every day was new and precious. Then one day, it all went wrong. Mom said, I'm not sure. Sure about what, said Dad. I'm not sure listening to you was a good idea. The thought was so crazy. Dad thought she must have heard it from a serpent. Life continued as it always had. But now, instead of picking berries, she made them clothes. They didn't want to see themselves anymore. They gave birth to you. Then they built roads, stacked up buildings. They made lamps so they wouldn't need the sun anymore. The sun got hot and the first snows came. Now and then a storm would destroy everything. Fields caught fire. The beasts started eating each other. The bees grew stingers and the food disappeared. They got divorced and Mom took you far away. Dad's still somewhere out there. He eats grain and roots, but he's always hungry. And Mom is never satisfied. It isn't a stretch to say... Everything's been just about the same ever since. Nine to five. At the burger joint, it's closing time. Escaping from my nine to five. The smokes are cheap, the burgers dry. It's the only way a man survives. Nine to five, nine to five. Always fighting for your life. It's what you need to stay alive. Change careers at 35. A decade and a half behind, before you know it, you're 49. Then 52, then 68, gets harder and harder working late. 72, then 73, and life moves faster than the breeze. Your eyes are dim. Your neck is weak. It's getting harder just to speak. 82, and still you're broke. Your friends are dead. There ain't much hope. No time for children or a wife, been punching clocks your whole damn life. Kidneys failing, teeth are rotting, brain is rancid, memory spotty. At 85, it ain't much better. Wheelchair work to pay the creditor. Government doctors, longer hours, wonder if they'll cut your power. Medications piling up, the money never is enough. Nine to five, nine to five, work until the day you die. Sit in a grave that you can't afford. And down in hell, you're also poor. You won't get out till you pay every penny. But there's no jobs in hell, so good luck being debt-free. Nine to five, nine to five, a cause of death in city life. But often it gets overlooked and hidden in the history books. A war to free the colored brave, now every color is a slave. Fighting just to eat today, anxiety until the grave. Sell your time and make a buck, think life is great when it really sucks. They make you think you're like a king while dying slowly on your knees. And before you know it, it's too late. The authorities have sealed your fate. You have not lived life for your brother, but lived life thinking you'll have another. And time's all spent. 
you're a bag of bones. May God have mercy on your soul. Nine to five, nine to five. Some are broke, but some survive. Debbie won the lottery. An easy million, not tax-free. Richard built a company. He rakes six figures quarterly. Johnny sets up water tanks, 500,000 in the bank. Thomas made a fine invention. Never fear is a life on pension. Some work hard and people praise him. Others jailed for tax evasion. Poor in money, rich in time, dropping dollars, grabbing dimes. And poor in time, but rich in money, at the cost of freedom. Life's so funny. Some are happy being broke. Some are dying for a smoke and half a burger at the joint. With prices rising, what's the point? And gas is rising by the day. Will you take the cost? Will it ever pay? Money made from politics. The fourth world war of stones and sticks. It pays to be a politician less to be an electrician. Big suits working nine to five seldom know how to get by. Standing on an ivory tower, egos always craving power. Nine to five, nine to five, make a few bucks on the side. Hide it from those prying eyes and build yourself a brand new life. Jobs don't make you self-sufficient. Time to learn to be proficient. Building, welding, life solutions. Help your neighbor's life improve and charge a dollar for your work. You'll know yourself how much it's worth. And when your coffee costs a grand, by then you'll live right off the land and raise some creatures, grow some food. There isn't much more to improve. May God above give you some rest and live your life out to its best. I hope we all get some sleep. I hope we all get some sleep with the bombs going off. We'll pull up the sheets and slip into slumber, tumbling down dreams of clouds, loud mouths silencing to horns of Peter and Gabriel filling the air. And God, I hope we can sleep. Amidst the panicked thunder, it's no wonder we've stayed so awake in our dread of tomorrow and borrowing time beyond debt. With aching legs that scream for mercy, we'll rest ourselves like rotting logs, crumbling in an autumn that covers the days like bedsheets. But more than any will or way, beyond the world and its folly, we'll take a trolley home, and I hope we all get some sleep. TV I'm willing to bet that half these women on TV are liars. When no one's around to see and the cameras are off, the crew takes to the streets to see who they can find. They get themselves a fine-looking specimen, chiseled jaw and slicked-back hair. They put him in a cozy room with pills to give him fatter hips. His hair falls out. They shine his teeth a new wig and makeup for a different look each week. Then, what's left of that person smiles for the camera and tells you what's really happening in the world. Every tree. Every tree has its roots. You can't always see them, but you know they're there. Not every tree is beautiful, but some of the ones that are have very ugly, knotted roots. The children sit on them and enjoy the quiet and the shade. One day, my mother took me in to get a haircut. I hadn't been going to school because school was making me sick. I didn't realize before it was too late that my mother had told everything to this hairdresser. She was old and slow and wouldn't shut up. She'd spend an hour on one client, and I don't know how she did it. I can't imagine I really wanted a haircut anyway. She didn't even do a good job. I think the only reason my mother even patronized her business was social pressure. 
I sat in the chair, and for the next hour, this old woman grilled me. I don't even remember what she said. It was like a stranger sorting through your underwear drawer. My mother watched from the sidelines and said nothing. The interrogation continued, and I started to cry. I'd never been told how to say no. Saying no came many years later. It was like getting raped with your parents' permission. In many ways, I was raped. It was impolite to tell people to stop raping you, so I never resisted. I felt like I was always wrong. The old woman didn't understand the words I used. She didn't have the same vocabulary. She had no business knowing what she knew. All she did was prove that I couldn't trust anyone. She held the mirror up to my hair when she was done. How does it look, she said. Good, I said, but I didn't recognize myself. She'd cut my hair in a way that made me look like a bully. To survive being surrounded by liars, I became a liar. To survive always being watched, I hid myself. Everything my mother found, she'd use against me. Everything my mother found would be twisted and distorted and whispered to the whole family. It was like strangers sifting through someone else's underwear drawer that they thought was yours. It was like people deciding exactly who you were and sentencing you to their own hellish idea of your future without knowing you. This is a wicked forest we're all in. Wicked trees growing from sick, worm-eaten roots. The nights are long and the beasts roam between the trees devouring whoever they may find. I don't know how many of us will be left, but I know the woodsman is coming. Every tree will have its time to be cut down, and any tree that is sick, weak, rotten, will be thrown into the fire. So grow up towards the heavens. Don't look down as you reach out with your arms. Where you came from is not important. Grow without looking to see how tall the trees around you are. Grow without a thought toward time or place or who or what. You're not the one who planted the seed. You're not the one who put you where you are. A tree that is wise knows it has no reason to run. A wise tree knows that running is not its nature. A tree knows that it cannot stop the fire. The wise tree waits, no matter what may come, and watches, and doesn't think about it. Art Most people hate art. They say they love it, but if they ever see art face to face, it makes them squirm. Art isn't the smeared rainbow crap in every stairwell. Art cannot be measured because it burns every measuring stick that nears it. It's one thing to paint a pretty picture. Painting pictures is a trade and a skill. Painting pictures is like building a house. It's one thing to paint a picture. Or paint a house. But it's another thing to paint art. If you need a place to lay your head at night, art is useless for that purpose. But a house is what's practical. Can openers are practical. Shoes and raincoats and pen and paper are practical items. They are not art themselves, but they can be used for artistic purposes. The crap people call art is useless compared to these practical things. Real art, the stuff that can't be faked, phoned in, packaged and processed, has a life that is longer than anything in this physical world. People say you can't have art and money. This is a blatant lie, though it is true that you can lose art in pursuit of money. After all, you can lose everything in pursuit of money. Art can live without money. Art can live despite money. Art lives no matter how much or how little it has. Art is dangerous. Art is war. Art makes your skin crawl. Art is wondrous and terrifying. Art can build the world and art can destroy the world. Art will make you unrecognizable to your fellow man. But the bottom line 
is that art is dangerous. A delicate balance of style and substance, you can kill the idea by doubting it. No one can make the art but you. Or rather, you do not make the art, but the art is made through you. And you can either tell the truth or tell lies. When art is made from lies, it's called propaganda. When art is made from truth, it's known as the truth, and the truth lives forever. You can tell the truth with lies, that's what every fairy tale is, and every fairy tale, the ones we all remember, have lessons. A fairy tale that has no truth has no worth. It is eternally poisonous. One is only worthy to be called an artist if one has lived. To make great art, one must live a great life. There is nothing special about an artist. They are not worthy of any pedestal. Artists are not smart. Artists are not special. Artists have only one job. To record every deadly thing they see in the world. An artist documents things that are deadly so that you might die. To a way of life that was merely an illusion. Art bends the fabric of false reality to reveal what has been hiding in plain sight. An artist shows you the beauty of the simple truth without wiping off the mud, without sterilizing, without modifying, without pretension what is to be seen by all. An artist only needs one finger to point to what's already there. Most people disguised as artists kill the soul. But a true artist has mercy. Art is not emotion. Art is not empathy. Art created with emotion is lies. Art is not activism. In fifty years you will be forgotten. Art is not made by extortion. Art is not made by protecting ideas. Art is made by exposing ideas. Money or no money, sunshine or rain, persecution or peace— Art is made when nothing else can be made. Art is the departure from lies that are all the same. Art isn't trying to be unique. Art isn't trying to be clever. Art isn't trying to be remembered. Art isn't pain. Art isn't joy. Art isn't fear. Art is what you find when you strip all of these things away. The field of journalism should be run by artists, but it's mostly run by cowards Every product should be art, but most products aren't real. Governments should be run by artists, but the first rule of government is lies. The stuff they call art today is a cancer to the soul, but art should nourish the sick and it should stun the healthy. Everyone has it in them to be an artist, but most live with lies. The people who call themselves artists are unworthy of their title. Art is not created out of schooling. Art in its purest form destroys schools. Unrestrained art destroys nations and brings the dead back to life. The fake artists try to kill the real ones. The real artists can't help but live. The eye can't help but see. The ear can't help but hear. And the soul can't help but know once it is free of the lies. And you... Observing the art may not have words to describe it or explain it, but you know in your heart that it is true, and it will always be true. No Room in Hell There's no room in hell. The wind howls over cracked brick and melting asphalt. No room for the dead. They line the streets looking for a bite to eat, a hot dog with relish, a butterscotch sundae. I could go for something like that. But there's no room in hell. The ambulance wheels another one of them off. I watch from my apartment window. I can't see much through the dirty glass, just dark shapes. And I see faces in the dirt. My father looks a lot like me. Sometimes people think I look younger than before, and people tell him he looks older. But who am I kidding? They don't really tell him that. In hell, everyone's nice. 
I can smell their ice cream, their boxes of chocolate. I smell the burgers fizzling in a pool of rancid industrial waste. They eat it all up. Feels good. Up in my room, I'm alone, sampling the all-your-eyes-can-eat buffet. But there isn't much flavor. Just the smell of my own sweat and urine. I pretend it's not my own. But that car's running out of mileage. An old black crow sits atop the roof, knocking bricks down the chimney. He doesn't give a damn about it all. I'm happy for him. He doesn't give a damn about all the food that lines these city streets. He takes what he pleases where he can get it. Swooping down while some invalid isn't watching, or pecking scraps up from the road. Like my dad used to say, when the sausages fell into the dirt, More seasoning! He's in the other room downstairs. Maybe he's sleeping. Or if he's dead, how would I know? Right about this time, my body insists on a cup of coffee. It already knows all the movements, rehearsed day after day to an audience of none, other than the flies on the wall, the bugs in the sink. But coffee makes me want to retch. And I'm so hungry, I'd rather tear my guts out than eat anything. There's no more room for me. No room in hell. I'm taking up all the space. And there's nowhere for me to go. Nowhere for anyone to go. But they keep on eating. And they keep on drinking and running their mouths about things that they'll forget in a week. And maybe that's giving too much credit. I sold all the credit I had. Now everyone else is getting their slice. It's too hot to think, too sticky to sleep. The mattress sags with ten years of sweat cushioned by mold and no stranger to moss. There's no room for me there either. The voices are so meaningless, so vain and vain and vain. It's a language that only speaks one word, a word that isn't worth a penny. It's the only word I was ever taught, but there's no room in hell. That's why they're all here. That's why they disappear when the food runs out, and I'm still here, awake, alone. Maybe it's time to move, somewhere where there's air to breathe. I don't care if there's ice cream, or a bed, or mom and dad, or fancy cars, or all my eyes can eat. All I need is a room to breathe, a place to be, a place no hellish mind can see. If hell's so full, I guess heaven's the only place to go. Gingerbread House The scariest people you will ever meet have smiles on their faces as they welcome you into their gingerbread house. They won't ask for a thing as they make you dinner. Such long nights in the woods you've spent. The scariest people will give you a bed to sleep in. And one dawn, you'll realize that you've been locked in a cage. But you'll eat better than you ever have. Or, if you're not one to only accept favors, perhaps you'll work your fingers till the flesh falls off and make the house better than it ever was. Either way, you'll be one to pity. I was once naive. People in gingerbread houses don't want what's better. They may laugh at your jokes, indulge in your stories, But their eyes will gleam like a crocodile. Because, believe me, they've been out in those woods even longer than you have. And you'd never guess just how hungry they are. You can tell because they do what they must to get what they want. And they'll never take those eyes off you. Those starving, innocent eyes. Come on in. Come on in. Hell is nice and warm. We've got bread and a three-ring circus. Watch your neighbors get skinned alive and cute little puppies rush from behind the curtain to lap up all the blood. 
Come on in. Have yourself a drink at the finest bar you've ever seen. Help yourself to some pretty women. This one slits her wrists each night. This one wants your credit cards. This one won't let you sleep. This one's looking for someone to feed her five children. Come on in. You look like a charitable man. We've got a talking TV parakeet pastor. He'll tell you everything you want to hear. We've got cars, cigars, and chocolate bars. All the dope you could ever smoke and a whole lot of illegal stuff, all in the name of fun. So come on in. Watch the girl Sodom as she disembowels Gamora. Stay up past your bedtime and see our midnight act. Find out if 75 years is old enough to be aborted. Hear the singing slit-throat man as he whistles through withered windpipes. Bring your girl down to the gossip cafe where everyone knows everything about each other. Make up something juicy about everyone you hate. You won't want to miss the brawls and broken windows. Every Thursday, it's patrons versus staff night. Friday is a war between all religions. And Saturday is whites versus blacks. And while you're out here, get your teeth pulled. The circus isn't just for entertainment. Visit with our tax specialists. Push papers and pump iron. What have you been putting off? What are you waiting for? Come on in. Don't tell me you've got something better to do. Come on in. This is all there is to life, and you don't want to miss it. Your Secrets when you blow out your brains, they'll be sure to cover up the holes with daffodils. They'll wipe away your blood with lemon water and mint. The stitches are of the utmost importance because they hold your mouth shut. With a suit over your scars and some nails on a box, they'll cover your story with six feet of dirt. After that, there's no way for them to see just how ugly you were. Enough. Another email. Another letter. When will these idiots realize I'm never going to buy their shit? I don't care if it's half off. I don't even care if it's free. I wouldn't even gift that shit to my worst enemies. I wouldn't even think about it, but they just don't stop. Somewhere out there... A landfill is piled up into the clouds with billboards, unredeemed offers, products that have come and gone, newspaper clippings, coupons, as seen on TV. Buy one, get one if you tell a friend and become a member. You could pave the road to hell with all that shit. Probably already is. How many millions of executives have there been, and nobody ever stopped and asked if any of this shit matters? How many people paused to reflect to wonder what the widget would do for people in a hundred years. In any of the thousand years before us, has anyone had the same idea? The ones that asked were probably fired. Today, they say, I want it now! Consumable product! So they come up with the shit. They figure out a way to package the shit. They run the numbers and talk to the shit factories to see if they can make the shit. They look for people to buy the shit. They look at everything you do and listen in on your conversations and turn over the same rocks and follow you into the bathroom to determine if you're today's lucky shit winner. And you see the pretty picture. And you think it'll make you feel better. Because they told you it'll make you feel better. And you give them your money and they mail you the shit. Then in five minutes, you forget about the shit because someone else is lined up to sell you some different shit. Shit to buy, shit to be afraid of, shit you've had a million times before with a cute little picture to make it feel special. This book was probably written a few hundred years ago, but that was yesterday's shit, and here I am writing it, and here you are reading it. And in a week... 
The flies at the ad agency have already found new shit to land on. And a hundred years from now, they'll be making the same shit, and they'll call it innovation, and genius, and science, and cutting-edge, and award-worthy, and once-in-a-lifetime, and they'll leave the rest of us grinding our teeth as we fail to lay comfortably in our graves. Play Your Guitar There's a man with a guitar and a nice shirt, but not for long. The bus is on its way. A few blocks down the street, there was another young man with a guitar, a little bit older than me, but another nice shirt. We played a song and laughed over small things. He wrote a song about his ex-girlfriend. Could have played it to millions on the radio, but I'm the only one who knows it. The streets of San Antonio are empty these days, but now and then, someone walks by, and now and then there's someone with a guitar, and a little bit of something left that's dying. I'm at the bus stop, and here's another stranger. People take pictures of me with my guitar. I get smiles and nice words, and none of it pays my bills. Here's this young man with a nice shirt. He plucks the same notes the world has plucked for forty years and shows me his teeth. Make anything today, he says. Only ten dollars. But it's better than nothing, I think. At least I can eat before the landlord boots us. His smile disappears. He picks idly with an empty gaze. How about you, I ask. He looks up. Nothing, really. People walk by stares and smiles. He keeps playing. Before long, the bus is pulling up, and before we head home, he tells me he's getting evicted this week. I say nothing. The ride is another sleepy hour, and as I step off the bus, I see him sitting alone, waiting for his stop. I would have said something, but all I can do is play my guitar while somewhere far from me, he plays his. Cancer When the dictator beats down for too long, when the king rends his subjects to shreds for mere amusement, when the leader drags his men through endless war, when the people starve and see death watching around every corner and are lost again, when they think they can't be any more lost than they have been, when the child is beaten with a razor strop, when you do the will of the one you hate, when you realize you can't please the king, the man realizes it's every man for himself, and the idea metastasizes from one person to another, until the whole kingdom is stained with blood, and the body dies. All the numbers lied tonight. I counted nine steps up to the attic, four twists of the key. I counted the seven circles I paced around the room so I could sit down once. I blinked my eyes twice so I wouldn't die, then twice for a brighter future, twenty-seven blinks and shakes it took until I could look out the window, and for a moment I could forget it all. Seeing the green of trees, peaks of houses, for a moment I could forget. There was more to be done. Then I had to tap twice, and blink a thousand times just so for a second I could feel I'd be all right. Then I walked down the smoky streets. I made sure to step over every crack with my left foot. I knew if I stepped over with my right, then my girlfriend would die on her hiking trip tomorrow. Three times I pressed the button and blinked twenty times to cross the street. I could barely see the cracks, but I knew where they were, and I stepped over most of them. My foot slipped and the tip of my shoe came down in the wrong place. My father's going to get murdered tomorrow. 
Someone's going to quietly pick the lock and slip inside. My father's going to be asleep and someone's going to walk down the hall and open his door and walk up to him sleeping in bed. He's going to listen to him a while like that. He's going to put a long, slick razor to his neck. And I had to run because a car barreled from around the corner. The number of steps from the corner to the quickie store is 27, and 27 is a very evil number. So before I reached the door, I took a turn and walked in a circle to make the number 30. 30 is not a good number, but it's not as bad as 27. Maybe if I blink 20 times, I won't have a heart attack tonight, I thought. I walked in, keeping my feet on the white checkered tiles, with each step, I tapped twice on my hip, hiding it so the clerk wouldn't think I was too strange. I walked to the back and found the tickets. Today's the 18th, I thought. So two more nights until the next lucky night. I filled out the sheet, and this time I managed to avoid smearing the pencil outside the lines. My number tonight is 528. God or the universe must love me. I made a $10 bet last night. If my number wins, I'll be able to eat on Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday, and for the next few months, and maybe for a little while, I can forget about the numbers. I'll forget to tap, and blink, and walk my walk, and my girlfriend won't smear her brains on the rocks, and Dad won't get his throat cut, and I'll be free, and life will be different. The clerk handed me the ticket. I almost forgot to take it with my right hand. I walked a circle outside and twenty-eight steps to the corner, and I walked back. By that point, I'd taken nine hundred and fifty steps. One thousand is the lucky number, so in the attic I followed the grooves my feet have worn in a circle on the floor. I counted a hundred and fifty steps, and tapped twice, and blinked a thousand times, so I don't die in my sleep. Tomorrow morning, I will wake up, and I'll find out if I'm a winner. Wooden Boy your whole life you've been a little wooden boy. Your parents kept you hanging on a string so you wouldn't leave. They taught you how to live a little wooden life just like everyone else. They taught you to put on a show. They traumatized you so well that you know how to dance for them even after they're dead. And when you make a mistake, you can't sleep. And you'll keep dancing so other people smile at you. You'll keep dancing so you won't see yourself. But when you go home tired and beat up and worn out and tore through, you have to pass the mirror to get to the shower. Will you open your eyes tonight? Or will you sit in the tub, drinking, tipsy from the intoxication of your mind that lets you disappear? You know if you cut the strings, the audience will boo. They'll throw rotting vegetables for you to eat the rest of the days of your sad wooden life. But if you cut the strings, you'll live. You've never been a wooden boy. You were never meant to hang on strings. So why are you holding on to them so tightly? Team Meeting That happens once a week. We get together and wag our chins, drink from our expensive and expansive collection of cheap wines, and fiddle with our coat pockets. Usually the first hour is competitive avoidance. Nobody wants to be that guy, but sometimes you have to be. Bob, I say. The room goes silent. Old Mr. Foster nearly drops his fork. The new guy, I say. We all know him. Robbie knows this shtick and fails to suppress a face-splitting grin. I grab a steak knife and begin wiping it off with a napkin. What's it been now, three weeks? Nobody knows for certain. But they like my theatrics. 
Well, I can tell you something. No matter how long it's been, I say it's too long. Willie finally speaks up. He's been going to mass every damn week, pays his bills. Heck, I even saw him put out his recycling at two o'clock. Who the hell does he think he is? And gentlemen, I say, this week I offered him my sandwich, and when he lost his keys the other day, found them in ten minutes. Mr. Foster bears his teeth. And I watched his stupid dog while he was with his wife at the hospital, giving birth, of all things. After he's spoken, it's gloves off for the night. We sit around for the next two hours and recount all the ways we pretend to like this asshole. Then tomorrow, we embrace the new day. My wife bakes him a cake. I know she's going to have a lot to say about that. Secretly, though, despite all the trouble, I think we all look forward to next week's team meeting. Death. Today I opened all the death papers and read about death until all the red pen monkeys keeled. Then I turned on the death box and watched the world crumble in the sunset and listened to the screams of the damned as they met their fate. I laughed at all the death reporters with their splotchy red ties and darkening sockets filling up with night. I laughed as I watched them all die. With smoke and dust lingering at my window sills, I went to brush my teeth and to watch my own face with fatigue. One day, I'll have a death grin, carved of bone, a face that will last an eternity. That's what the voices on the death speakers say as I lay down on my deathbed. And as the world rumbles and all the clocks stop, and every child walks off a cliff, and every dream disappears into an all-consuming light. I marvel what a time it is to be alive. If I had a child, if I had a child, they wouldn't have a screen to stare at, no colored logos filling every corner, no tailored ads or search results, no messages, mail or multi-chat, no games or keyboards or controllers. If I had a child, they would see the color of the sky. They would see stars. No moments lost to the feed that feeds on you. No sycophants in the so-called enlightened. No world where everyone says they're right. No world programmed by invisible prison makers. Why only eight circles of hell when everyone can have their own? But if I had a child, he wouldn't be alone. Like all the other kids who sit in their rooms while mom microwaves dinner and dad scrolls through the hungry feed, if he's even around at all, my child wouldn't be alone. My child would see a different world. A world where there is no such thing as school and no reason to run from anything. A world that can be defeated no matter how dangerous it may be. A world where hope is all there is. A world where strength is the only thing to stand on. The only thing to feed on comes from the wide green pastures and the woods where the beasts are found sleeping. Everything else can destroy itself if it pleases. All that will remain is a quietness that hasn't been heard in thousands of years. The Cage My dad kept me locked up in the attic, but when the neighbors came by, I was too clever for him. He'd catch me listening at the stairs and chase me up, saying, "'You're looking for your last breath, boy!' He kept me where I belonged, my own little corner of hell. In hell, the silence is so loud, and the only thing to look at is the window you want to jump out. Every day you're waiting. You can't see the clock ticking down, but you know it's there. When you're a kid, you can forget to stand in line. The adults have to whip you until they don't have to anymore. When you're young, freedom is who you are. 
but it's not allowed when anyone's around. And I'd stay up there in the attic until the next time he'd catch me being myself again. Hunger. I'm watching the whole world eat itself. It hasn't died yet, but I'm not hungry. I'm watching the whole world lie and beat itself up. I don't know what it thinks it's going to get from all this. I'm watching the fat pig eat his slop. It's all he knows. I'm watching all sense of purpose die. I'm seeing life being lived for no reason, living for the sake of living, eating for the sake of eating, waiting to die and enjoying every bite. One day, you'll go back to nothing. And if you've forgotten that you are nothing, the nightmare that lies in wait for you is ready to taste your infinite distress. But those who know they're nothing live. The beast cannot dine on nothing, so it will starve. Take away the food. I can go hungry. I have everything I need. Take away the whole world and give me a dark room with nobody and no thing. I have everything I need. Call me anything and everything you want. Throw every stick and stone and word and see what happens. I'll still be sitting here. I have everything I need. You eat everything and are unsatisfied. I eat nothing and I'm full. And if you could admit to being wrong, you could live like me and you'd never need to eat again. Letter found at a prison suicide. When I was 16, I went upstairs to the loft. I'd never seen the gun before, but I had heard it was there. The loft was piled high with boxes. The cardboard was damp from the leaky roof and last night's rain. I found photo albums, pictures of people who looked like me, or my father or my mother, but I didn't understand them any more than that. I found crates of old records, clothes with rat droppings and dead moths. I found mold and all kinds of things that might have been recognizable 50 years ago. At first, I thought it was an instrument case. It was like the ones the kids in band brought to school. It was black and scratched up, almost half as long as me, and it was unlocked. That's when I knew I wouldn't have to keep this secret forever. Two weeks later, it was the last day of school, but no one knew it except for me. I waited and I watched. Suddenly class wasn't so boring. For all they knew, it was like any other day, but everyone looked afraid of me. Their eyes held on me too long, their voices quivered when they spoke, the air was slimy. During lunch I walked off to the park, where I'd hidden my tool of escape. I knew that when I'd return and wait for all the other kids to shuffle into their seats, I would finally be free. They'd put my face everywhere. I'd become a household name. Everyone would be afraid of me long after I'm dead. And best of all, they'd change the laws. They'd fight in the street. They'd champion me as a villain and make me a hero to their cause. They'd blame everything in the world except for me. They'd blame everything except for the sickness that builds out, growing new blood vessels and spreading while no one watches, a sickness that eats and eats until there's nothing left to eat anymore. I may be sick, but now I'm free. Bloody Heights "'Tis I who's tallest,' said Grimes, hair swaying in the draftless room. "'Indeed,' I admitted, "'though you missed one fatal flaw.' "'Flaw,' said Grimes, "'what fatal flaw? "'Do my shoes not make me six nine? "'They do,' I said, "'but I carry the sword.' "'And I lopped off his head. "'Modern Journalism 
The world is better than it has ever been. Well-being is at an all-time low. People are living longer than they ever have. Suicide is at an all-time high. People are unhappy because they don't have enough pills to make them happy. People are stupid because they don't do what the smart people tell them to. People kill each other because they have the tools to kill each other. What you thought was bad for you is really good for you, and what you thought was good for you is about to kill you. Walk for your lives. The world has ended, but nobody has noticed it yet. Every problem you have is someone else's fault, and they probably have more money than you. Come again, and we'll tell you more tomorrow. God at the dinner table. The lights are low. The night is young. And all I know is the hunger within these early hours. A glass of water in my right hand, I sit at the table, marveling at the stainless steel pot, clean from last night. The sink has run dry for a little while now, but the bathtub roars with life. So I fill the pot with water and marvel at the time. Sitting in my chair again, I slice through an onion, laughing at the times I lost the knife and used a spoon instead. The room is icy in the corner where I sit and work. The air is stale, sometimes cloying. I open up the window just to crack sometimes, but this morning I leave it shut in anticipation of the warmth of the boiling water. The slices of onion float in the pot, waiting patiently on the range for the crescendo of a boil. While they sit, I slice a chuck roast into pieces no smaller than the tip of my thumb. I used to lose my mind this way, sitting in silence, letting the mind wander. What an imagination, I was told as a child, but no one told me what I already knew, that the imagination is a curse. Imagination puts people on the end of a rope, at the end of a morgue where they poke and prod you with sharp metal objects trying to figure out just what happened to you. Imagination puts you at the bottom of a pill bottle because the future you imagine is so vivid and all-consuming. Imagination makes your heart stop, your soul ache with torment, every part of your being longing for an escape. Imagination is a drug that fails to cure the disease it has created. What an imagination you have. I wonder how many survivors are out there, other than me. How to create an artistic mind. Take a normal child and break him over your knee with the pain of everything in this world that is undeserved and unnecessary. Cut off his legs with neglect and leave him broken without answers. The pain and unresolved nature of his life story will spark a wondrous fire in the mind that glows bright, but will eventually outburn everything any wildfire. That fire becomes the child's existence. He paints to understand the pain. He watches the world with nothing to say, but when all the answers to the same questions do not satisfy, he pleads for something bolder. Now you have a child with a weak body and a mind that could burn New York City to the ground. A sign on the side of the road states calmly, Suicide is the second leading cause of death for ages 15 to 17. The author of the sign? A therapy center. No doubt run by survivors of the same mind-searing upbringing. And many believe the mind can be sharpened into a sword or a pen or a needle to stitch up the lost and wounded, a Swiss army intellect. But no such thing exists from man alone because as well as you can imagine solutions, you can twice as easily imagine new problems, especially in the early hours, especially when the body is restless. What an imagination! What a thing indeed! All the same, as God gave Paul a thorn of torment, God allows the world to light my mind on fire, so that when the smoke dies down, I may see him and understand, so that I may... Understand the joy of silence. And already the beef is done, cut and bloody on the board. 
In the pieces fall, splashing as they meet the onions. The steam warms the room, and I lean back in the chair, knowing the stillness of the room and the little bubbling of the pot. I used to not enjoy this. I would feel the sting, and the pain would wrap its fingers around my heart no more in the quiet. Now I simply am. The thoughts come, and the voices tempt, but by God's will they lay bound with chains, each one captive. Nothing aches from the past. The soul does not retch, anticipating the future. All pain is endured. The truth does not waver. Lies do not last. And wickedness is cut down like the wheat in the field. And I pray for those who do not comprehend that their wounds make them cry out and that they know they are heard and that their minds are forged of God into swords against evil that dispassionately endure the moment, the quiet, while the wicked spirit dies screaming in its own fire. And I sit alone with no one except God and I at the dinner table. He does not need my words. He is the truth inside. He is in the stillness and speaks through revelation. In the stillness, I am not alone. In the silence, while I eat the food, he knows the gratitude I have of a bird who eats the food God delivers to him, never knowing where the next feast will be, but living in peace. And as the warmth leaks out through the cracks in the window, I look out to see the blue glow of an approaching sunrise. And though beyond my room is chaos, the clouds inside me are still. I sit, shielded from within, against all that dares to destroy peace, and inside my heart I give thanks, not as words or as a routine to please a tyrant that I fear, but as someone who knew the pain and knows how merciful his mercy is. And I pray for the survivors and the clueless and for their guidance in every moment as I need guidance, and pray for light in the world, like the light that glows while I sit with God at the dinner table, knowing without sight, sight within stillness, calm within chaos. Shoot for the Stars The most comfortable place to be is a place where you don't give a fuck. The world tries to make you angry, to force you to make up your mind on a revolving door of orchestrated drivel. All you have to do is close your eyes. When will the participants realize they don't have to play the game? How much pain before they're willing to consider crossing out the rules? The pen has always sat on your table. It has always been in your stationery collection, but all your co-workers insist that something's coming. Don't pick up that pen. Don't change the rules. You'll miss out on all the fun. But we all know they can't admit to their fear. They're too afraid to change the rules of the game because now they depend on what they hate. Their mistake is giving a fuck. And because they give a fuck, you give a fuck. So who the fuck is winning in all this? How many corpses lay buried beneath the surface of the moon? They thought they were moving forward, grinding their way along the cutting edge. But it never stopped them from dying. Shoot for the stars. But if you look out from under your rock, see the sky a burnt black, the stars are nothing but ambition. The stars are places for people to get burned up where dreams die and reality lives. You spend so much time looking for a way forward, a way out of the trap, that you never think to look out the window. And then you have the audacity to feel sorry for yourself giving a fuck about how you shouldn't have given a fuck. But before you're able to complete the circle of chasing your own tail, the whole world fills with light. And before you forget what light is, or the nothing beyond that's neither light nor dark, you realize you've gotten your reward, but you've already forgotten it. The Bread Man He lay on the table, round and thick, his skin warm and crispy like crust. His innards are doughy, soft, and slick, 
which offers the purest disgust. But they brush him with butter, and into the cutter he slides like a gourmet delight. Fresh milk from the udder they pour in a glass, and they feast as the royalty might. No screams, no cries as they pull out his eyes, no words as they rip out his tongue. It's the mistress who knows, as they slice off his toes, that the bread is a measly disguise. Unique, how rare, as they slide from their chairs. This dinner is simply divine. The mistress, she grins, grabs a bottle of gin. Just wait till we open the wine. Dead Rodent Haiku Slyly sobbing mouse, crushed under, red, from my cold, inhumane shadow. Teeth My family is a corpse that hasn't quite died yet. One by one the teeth are turning black from the inside out. When it's time, they fall down and disappear down the gullet. Sometimes the body lifts its head off the table and looks around. The eyebrow hairs have long fallen out, but the folds in the skin reveal all the discontent you could ever want to see. I don't know who they were. I don't think they're leaving anything behind. Just a social security number and a birth certificate and school transcripts and driver's licenses. The ink fades, and the filing cabinet is full of pale squares of varying sizes. What is it all for? And why do they take it all so seriously? Death Sentence There's no point in the death penalty if most people are already dead but the dead people that form the skeleton of this antisocial parody of what we knew as America will eat the living if they are able. But it was an undeserved death that redeemed the world. In the eyes of the wicked, who is worthy of slaughter? All. Yet mercy comes from the cruelty of a life sentence. Mercy comes to the man who slams his head against the wall, day and night, his forehead is bruised all black and purple. The walls are stained with his blood. Then one day his head stills, his eyes open. We do not choose to be born into hell. We do not choose the sickness we've inherited. We do not choose the illusion of choices. From birth we listen to voices, and the voices tell us what to do. And most of the world listens to the same voice that is a death sentence unto itself, a death without bloodshed, a death of something greater that could have been, but was never seen, never heard, never understood. And when that dies, the world dies with it. Bobo I don't get out a whole lot these days, but I was at the drugstore and I found a new issue of Newly Observed. I couldn't resist. There was even a monkey on the cover. When I got home, I made myself some coffee and started reading. On page 45, it said, The Enigma of Primate Nutrition. New research reveals that most primates eat more fruit than humans. I laughed. These academics are always so full of shit. I put the magazine down and saw that it was ten till noon. Time again at last. I went out into my back garden. The trees were finally showing their leaves for the first time since last year. It almost floored me. I went into my garden shed and grabbed a vacuum pack from the deep freezer. By the time I'd gone down to the cellar stairs to see Bobo, I couldn't feel my fingers. Here you go, Bobo, I said. His eyes glinted. The tips of his canines poked out from beneath his upper lip. I set the pack in his bowl of water. Bobo was smart. He knew in a little while that the flesh would thaw out, and he'd pull apart the plastic and start chewing on the knuckle joints one at a time. I'd made sure I'd taken off the wedding band when I'd made that cut, so he wouldn't choke on accident. 
I smiled back at him, and he watched me turn up the stairs. I sat down at the dining table, and when I glanced down, I saw the journal again. God damn if I could remember the last time Bobo asked for a banana. Sage and Smoke Everyone seemed to know our apartment was haunted, but they avoided talking about it. I had a friend over. We talked, drank coffee, ranted about the movies. After the weekend, he was back on the road home. That place is definitely haunted, he told me months later. It's something about the hallway, the other bedroom on the corner, and the bathroom. What the hell was it with that bathroom? I would have intrusive thoughts, sometimes in the form of images. I saw a man nailed to a cross like Jesus, but his head was the rotting skull of a goat. I saw the maggots. My skin itched, but there were no flies. I could see in my mind someone was at the door. It was the same man every time. He hid in the entrance around the corner and under the stairs, and when I was alone, he'd walk up to the peephole and breathe slowly. But I never really told anyone about it. Then one day, my mother walked into my room with a large, round spray bottle. This is sage, she said. I want to spray it in that corner. Years before, she'd had conversations with a clock radio that turned on and off by itself. She talked to it as if it were her dead father. Then she said it was demons. She had a friend take the radio so it could be blessed by a priest. Before the priest could say a word, the radio fell from his hands and broke. So the radio wasn't a problem anymore. A while later, we moved an old TV into that room. It eventually became my room. The TV would turn on by itself and the volume would crank up to the highest setting and the walls would shake. She had another friend drop it off at the dump. We need to cleanse the demons, she said, shaking the little bottle. I wanted to tell her to get the hell out, but I simply said, no, I'm busy. She disappeared down the hall. A few days later, she snuck into my room and sprayed the little bottle in the corner. By then, it had been years, and that TV had been long gone. She would sneak into my room and rearrange things while I was away. I would go to bed feeling alone, violated. Sometimes, I would come back into my room and smell sage. Eventually, she couldn't pay the rent, and I left. After that, I found myself in fearful moments, but I was never spooked the way that apartment spooked me ever again. That's crazy, my friend said, after I told him everything. He went off to bed. I lay there on the couch while something scratched on the back door of the house. It was almost Halloween. I slept soundly. The Use of a Knife Sometimes you have to pull the knife out. It stings, sliding between your skin inch by inch. You wince, feeling the open puncture in your lung. You want to scream, but you're breathless. You want to bite out your tongue, but you've got something to say. You want to run, but you're too busy bleeding. So all you can do is slide it out. Feel the air with its burning kiss. Now, you're holding the blade between loose, twitching fingers, and you're met with a decision as you stare off into the blood-smeared reflection. Will you sever your attachment to the rage that tempts you? Open letters you never thought to read? Cut your hair so you can see what's looking back from the mirror? Remove the splinters from your fingers, or dare I say it, inflict someone else with the same pain? Teachers Teachers have no business being around children. The only thing they know in life is teaching. There are two types of students in this life. One learns to survive in the plastic soft edge environment. 
They find comfort in the system and play it like a game, as they were taught to do. This type of student grows up. They become so skilled at following orders and filing papers that they go to school again and become a teacher. That way, after they've completed their education, they can turn around and put more future generations through the same hell. The other type of student realizes they're in hell. They question the insane fools that nailed childhood to a cross. They question the need for grown adults to beat them over the head with ideas. The questioning provokes the system to beat the child harder until they either submit or become a rogue to society. There are two types of students. The ones that live their own lives or the ones that live the lives of others. The ones who've lived a life are worthy of teaching. But teaching is the last thing they will ever want to do. Burn it all. When you go to bed, always keep a knife with you. When you're out alone in the woods, always keep your blade ready and sharp. Look back at the sliver showing your reflection against the edge. Another day and the only thing to pay your stomach's debt is blood, fresh from something that crawls belabored over rocks and leaves. When you go to bed, make sure you keep the fire roaring. The nightlife won't dare to cross the path of smoke and soot. Maybe it would be better if we could all somehow walk backwards through time. I would find the inventor of the electric camera and burn his house to the ground. Because in the future, they all look at us through those things. They're smaller than the eye of an ant, and they count every one of your steps. They know how fast your heart beats and they count the number of hairs on your head. Even the computer in its primitive state is no threat to man. They're really not much more than calculators. But the things they sell at the store, those things aren't computers. Computers haven't been around for a long time. They've got a file somewhere with your name on it, and mine too. They've got everything they could ever want to know about you. They've got books full of all the words you've ever said, and mine too. They've got all the words you've ever thought of. They've got every word that was never written in this book. They've got everything that's impossible to put to words, except for God himself. If I could walk back through time, I'd find the guys who got the bright idea to regulate farming, and created patents and legal landmines. I'd drop all of them in a pit, I'd make it illegal for those people to exist. They're a disgrace to God, a disgrace to humanity, they're animals. But even if it was all cleaned up, and the world was quiet, and no one was watching, what would be left of it all? So here we are, around the fire, the smell of ash and burning leaves. Before you go to bed, set another heavy log in the pit. Strop your blade in case you hear footsteps at night. And if you hear them coming, and you see their flashlights beaming in from between the trees, don't make a sound. And don't hesitate. Johnny Johnny was the uncle I never had. He was my neighbor on the opposite corner of our apartment building as I was growing up. He was a proud sleaze. He had many girlfriends, strippers, school teachers, and sometimes both. When he was young, he huffed in the gunpowder air and the Agent Orange in the war. One day he was out on the field and all his buddies were at his side. A live grenade fell down from the muddy sky right in their midst. At that moment, he said an angel wrapped its arms around him. And he was the only one who didn't get blown to hell. Ever since that, he lived a quiet life. He paid his taxes and smiled when he saw a pretty girl. He put big fat locks on his front door and always kept his guns on him. The inside of his apartment was like an ornate, exotic jungle, with gorillas and the three monkeys and palm leaves and cardboard cutouts of Hollywood girls. He had a little round TV and a VHS collection with all the good stuff. He got himself a ton of kittens and lived with his girlfriend until 
he felt a pain in his side. Within a year or two, the cancer had eaten him down to nothing. All his stuff was taken or sold or given away or thrown out. His girlfriend had to move away, and I'm sure the place is unrecognizable now. I guess nobody survives in the end. I don't know if Johnny had a family, or if anyone remembers him, or if anyone remembers his story. So here it is, and there it was, for what it's worth. The Crowd We smile at people we don't like, and vote for people we hate, and buy nice things we don't want, and talk with people not worth talking to, and get educations we don't need, and get married to devils, and murder saints, and praise evil, and protect murderers, and appease dragons, and sleep very little, and work very hard, and do what we're told, and scream with the crowd, and dream with the crowd, and laugh with the crowd, and cry with the crowd, and move with the crowd, and live with the crowd, and die with the crowd, so that maybe, for a few minutes, we won't feel alone. Daniel I am the thing that lives inside Daniel Wagner. When he opens the door to let you in, when you see him smile, when he invites you to the fresh coffee pot, when you see the glint that shines like cellophane over his eyes, that's me. Every day Daniel wakes up, or sometimes sleeps in. Once or twice a month someone will knock at the door, a visitor, usually a pleasant one. I get up and greet them. Daniel must be knowledgeable. He must be friendly and wise and inoffensive, if nothing else. He must be the most engaging person in any conversation. He must have that spark, that warmth that draws people closer. When it's time to leave, the visitor must have this longing, a pain that comes from cutting short a pleasant time. They mustn't want to leave, though it's getting late. I walk to the kitchen, and I eat. And I eat, and I eat, and I eat, and I tell Daniel that he can relax now. Thank God, I tell him, that whole ordeal is over. Then I lay down in bed, and I tell Daniel all kinds of things. I have to change it up a little every night, otherwise he'd cease to feel anything about my words. We'll go on this way, talking and eating and whispering all kinds of dreadful things. And the longer Daniel listens to me, the more he relaxes in the thought that I am him. And as long as nothing gets in the way, he'll believe that I am him, and he will defend me, because in his mind, I do not exist. In his mind, he's Daniel Wagner, and everything is all right. The Secret It was a foggy night on the seaside. Look, said a young boy to his grandfather. There's something out there in the water. The old man squinted, and behold, there was something. It was a body, large and white, shrouded in pristine robes. Suddenly the old man's eyes were wide. No, he muttered, terrified. It can't be. He refused to say another word. The old man dragged his grandson down to the church, where he called for the priest. The old man was so afraid to tell the priest what he'd seen that he would only confess it in a hushed whisper with no one else in a locked room. The priest, startled by the old man, called his ministry to him, and they all walked out to the seaside. When they arrived, the priest fell to his knees. The young boy saw that his eyes were streaming small rivers down to the sea. It can't be, the priest said. But it is. There was silence among all of them. God has died. God, the young boy thought, dead? He stared out to the shrouded body. He watched the stone-still face of a calm corpse larger than life itself. But he couldn't believe it. 
What are we to do? the old man asked. The whole congregation was shocked to silence. We must continue our work, said the priest. When finally the silence was too much to bear, the old man nodded, thinking it was a reasonable proposal. But their work would have to continue tomorrow. No one was allowed to talk about what had happened. If God is dead, the boy thought, what work is there to continue? Nobody spoke another word that night. The priest and his men went out in the street and pulled the body far out beyond the edge of the ocean. Weeks passed. Across the village all was quiet and still. Even the birds seemed too solemn to sing. Every Sunday the priest would stand before his congregation and speak for hours about how God is always there, and when the audience cheered, the boy couldn't help the pain welling in the oceans of his eyes. Then, one night, he felt a knowing. It was not a hearing, nor a touching, not a word and not a voice, but it spoke to him. That was not your father. He knew. I am your father. He cried again, but this time... It was in a burst of relief. But who had that been out in the water? He also knew, from that knowing inside him, that he had to leave. This is a wicked place, he knew, and these people do not know what they see before them. So in the middle of the night, the boy grabbed his things and left, and he knew, if he trusted that knowing, he would never be afraid of anything ever again. He walked for miles, and when he turned back, he saw his village, his hometown, engulfed in a hungry fire. What happened to you? You lied again, but this time, Mother wasn't going to let it slide. What happened to you? She scolded and reached for a spoon on the kitchen counter. You were only six at the time. Not enough years to anticipate what was coming. She turned on the burner, held the spoon to the cool blue flames until it glowed. Then she made you open your mouth. When you got to school the next day and the teacher saw you couldn't talk right like you used to, she asked, What happened to you? It was too complicated to explain. You said you were sick, and no one questioned it. Two weeks later, after Father had his morning share of vodka, he coaxed you into your bedroom. He closed the blinds nice and tight and asked you why you weren't making any friends at school. When you had no answer, he beat you over the back with a wrench he'd brought home from work. For the first time that night, you didn't even want to cry. You lay there in the humid dark of your room, cockroaches scuttling around the bed and listened to the incessant barking of the neighbor's dog, that stupid mutt. Later that year, your mother found a lump on her back that was making it hard to sleep. She decided she'd live with it. On Christmas Eve, several years later, you didn't expect anything under the tree, but you couldn't sleep anymore. At four in the morning, you wandered into your mother's room and found her dead. She'd left a spoon and a glass of water on the nightstand, and you remembered how she wouldn't give you a glass of water after what she'd done. You dumped the glass on her face, and after your father found out, he wouldn't utter a word to anyone. A week after your 18th birthday, after father came home from work, he went into the backyard. He smoked a cigarette and listened to the radio. After he'd smoked it down to the filter, he got his pistol from his closet and blew his brains out. When you found him laying there, fragments of his skull shattered over the porch, you called the police and walked away. You never looked back. Thirty years later, your eyes are surrounded by pitch-dark circles. When people see you on the street, they always ask, What happened to you? Even though your father's wrench ensured you'd never walk straight again, you'd found a job at the lumber mill pushing paper. You decided pretty women just aren't in the cards for you. When they see your face, even the most skilled liars can't hide their wincing. If they'll even talk to you, they ask, 
What happened to you? Next door to your crummy apartment, the old man's dog yaps endlessly. That Christmas, the old man gave you the keys to feed the dog while he's out visiting family. One night, at two in the morning, you grabbed that yapper by the throat and twisted his head off. Your neighbor won't talk to you anymore after that. Another day, you get the idea to visit the school you went to growing up. You watch the kids coming back from Christmas break, and that gives way to all sorts of fantasies. And after the police find you, and they put your face all over the TV and newspapers, the world is left wondering, what happened to you? You watch from prison as the news anchors laugh. He was probably born that way. In the shower. It's cold in the bathroom. And I'm so tired. Tired of the dirt that's filled in the fine line cracks on my heels. I'm tired of the oil that slicks my hair and makes it weep. I'm covered in sand and soot and soil and salt. So I crank up the dial and a few drops of icy water drip down on my arm, making me quiver. I wait until I can feel the warmth of the steam rising up, and then I sit down under the cascade of warm water. You never realize how stiff your joints are until they loosen, and you never realize how much your muscles have been holding in until you realize there's nothing to hold on to. The water is what reminds you, even though the truth was there all along. The steam rushes up to greet the sliding door forming a glass-bead mosaic that obscures the outside world. Every lie disappears, because all that exists is here and now. The dirt lets go and flows down to the drain, an army of little dark specks heading out on a long journey. Time itself has vanished, but I know, before long, that it's time to stand, and as I crank the dial off and reach for my towel... I wonder how I could have ever lived comfortably with all that dirt. Fake World What happens is, people feel the world isn't good enough. The clothes aren't as smooth as they'd like, so they find a way to iron out the fibers so they slide like silk. But that isn't good enough because, you see, people's skin doesn't shine the way they want. So they find a way to coat the skin with things that make it shine when it really doesn't. But that isn't good enough either, because too much time is spent walking out under the sun, so they build a machine that puts the horse six feet under, a machine that rolls faster than the devil on a moonlit night, and now everyone lives out of their cars. But that isn't good enough, because bugs and animals eat the crops, So they invent poisons to kill all the vermin but keep the plants alive. And so what if they poison us? Because humanity, to some, is little more than an inconvenience. So they invent a plastic world with people who eat disposable plastic food and live disposable plastic lives never feeling the sun beneath a layer of shine on their skin. They live their whole lives not knowing what life is and live lives more miserable than vermin, because at least the vermin can sleep after they dine under the cold moonlight. Company Man What a time to be alive, and what a miserable time it is to work. You walk into some godforsaken office. The room has glass windows on all sides, but they're covered with tightly shut blinds. It's stuffy and cramped in there with all kinds of junk, and there's a little man sitting at the desk. That little man is your boss. He's called you over to tell you that life is going to be living hell for you. He says, between the lines, that he's a skilled psychopath and looks forward to skinning you alive the moment he gets the chance. He asks why the floor wasn't mopped last night because drug addicts were pacing back and forth on it, sir. That doesn't seem to amuse him, but it's the truth. 
The rest of your shift that night, you keep looking over your shoulder, waiting to see your boss with a carving knife or perhaps a hacksaw. You wonder if he's going to take you out fast or keep you alive while he savors peeling the skin away from your feet. One of your co-workers says he enjoys working here. He says, with the biggest smile you've never seen from him before, that in a year or two, and if the boss man likes your work, he'll raise your pay. By a dollar. Wow. You don't think. My life is wonderful and worthwhile. Why is it that every single stuck-up hiring manager wants you to lie whenever you walk in for an interview? The whole process is founded on an ornate stack of carefully structured lies. How would you describe your previous boss? The only way to answer a question like this is with a lie. If your previous boss was so wonderful, you probably would have stayed, right? If your previous job was a magnificent glowing walk through nature, why leave? But if it's one thing hiring managers hate, it's honesty. Honesty is a threat to the air of compliance that must be maintained in the workplace at all costs. Why are you seeking employment with us? We all know the real answer. The real answer is that you just want to eat and pay your bills and save up a little on the side. It's common sense. But don't you know, common sense is illegal here. All they want to know is that you're going to prioritize your master above all else. They want some kind of lie about how Company X seemed like such a fit for your long list of skills and interests. They want to see you scrambling, waiting with teary eyes to kiss the boots of your superiors. Because here, we're all like family. Your boss once asked you, So what are you going to do with your paychecks? Of course, the correct answer is none of your fucking business, Mussolini. But really, there are only wrong answers to this question anyway. You apply to jobs, where they'd usually hire anything that breathes. No response. You read about labor shortages and how people just don't want to work anymore. But no one answers the damn phone. Then you pick up a book written during the Great Depression. You read about the help-wanted signs at businesses that weren't hiring. It's been about a hundred years, but I guess the people are the same as they ever were. You read the news and see the people singing praises of such a strong economy, but everyone you know is only a few steps away from running on empty. People with money are looking forward to being without it. If they lie on their job descriptions and lie when they're hiring and expect you to lie along with them and lie about your priorities and lie just so you can spend your time and get an extra dollar per hour in a few years and you'll spend every minute they ask of you giving everything to them that you can possibly give and show up on time and go beyond expectations and they'll still lay you off. Is it any surprise the way people act? In this world, involuntary. You open and close the cabinet while you talk. Why? While you're driving down the highway, you rub your thumbs side to side against the steering wheel. You beat your big toe down on the floor to a rhythm of a song that no one else can hear. You draw one line after another while the voice whines over the phone. As you lay in bed, you brush your fingers up against the folds in the sheets. You count them one at a time, front to back, back to front. The next day, you find yourself counting, but don't realize it until you've reached a hundred. Your eyes drip with the dew of morning tears, and you don't know why. You scream at the person closest to you and tear their heart out and chew on the gristle, and you regret every moment of it. You don't even know why you started. You tear down your child because his questions threaten you. And for a moment, you forget what it felt like when your parents did the same things to you. As you drift off to sleep, you sway your feet, scissoring them, swimming in the sheets. And when you wake up, you're still asleep. And when you go to work, you're snoring. And when you talk to people, it's beautiful gibberish. And when you think of what your life is like, it's all a lie. And when you're about to drive off the side of the road with your eyes shut, someone tries to wake you. And when they jostle your shoulder and bring you to consciousness, you want nothing more than to kill the Good Samaritan. Thoughtless 
It almost burns the tips of my fingers to type it. My grandfather is almost completely incoherent. My grandmother rolls along in her chair when she's strong enough to get out of bed. The clock on the wall reads five. We're all tired, but the conversation is far from ending. My grandfather has been reduced to a blubbering pile of gibberish, barely alive, barely holding on to what a word means. He almost doesn't realize how much his wife hates him. I guess it's for the better. Grandmother barks down the hall, and the blubbering man complies with every order, barked out with singed vocal cords that stink of sour charcoal. Time is cruel, but they're doing it to themselves. But they're unaware of themselves. But they get what they deserve. But they could easily escape. But they're happy where they're at. How can people be so happy in a homemade hell? How can anyone find satisfaction in a slow death falling apart piece by piece? How can anyone make a cage so comfortable in the hundred degree summer? How can fools champion marriage when there's no love anywhere you go? How can anyone enjoy a conversation when the only way forward is blood-curdling screams and broken furniture? How is there a world outside when the people inside are rotted out, born dead, and enjoying a leisurely decomposition? People look at the screens and bury themselves in the books so they don't have to look down and see their putrefied flesh. People have their eyes closed so the flies don't land on them. On the outside, it doesn't end well for hardly anyone. But why are they so willing to let their insides go to waste? Trial by Violence A young me didn't understand the American justice system. My mother said, When a conflict happens, it is your right to be heard by a jury of your peers. I thought about my peers. That sounds awful, I said. Why on earth would you say that? She didn't understand that I understood my peers. One day, when I was in the second grade, we were learning the science of sound. The class was divided up into groups, and we were given stethoscopes. I had the stethoscope in my ears, and the girl next to me pulled the diaphragm from my hands and started banging it on the table. Thunder clapped inside my head, and the shots scraped at my eardrums. I don't know why she hated me so bad. I told the teacher. The teacher asked us both what happened. She said she didn't do anything. I explained. The teacher said she has no reason to lie. So what happened to me was my fault, and I was now in trouble. Some of the kids realized they could have fun torturing me. They would laugh to see me in pain. It didn't matter. This is hell. So no, I thought, why on earth, knowing what I know, would I trust my peers to act in my best interest? The adults didn't seem to get it. I saw men on death row. The system didn't realize they were innocent until after they'd been murdered. I saw people commit terrible acts, only to be set free. I saw teachers take their problems out on their students. I saw adults pick favorites. And I saw formless crowds ready to kill anyone who thought differently from them. In elementary school, I saw how nobody was trustworthy. I didn't realize until I was older that what I saw in my peers was really the parents of my peers. But even all these years later, I still wouldn't trust them because trusting them can kill you. Sleeping House of Cards I laugh when people praise a large and fierce company by saying it must have been a gift from God. The corporation pays their bills and keeps them warm in the winter. And I laugh because it's only a matter of time before the house of cards falls and everyone below is crushed flat. Afterwards, these people say the corporation is a curse from Satan, and now those of us watching see them for the liars that they are. And I think to myself, these people wouldn't recognize God if he walked past them on the street, but if they saw the devil, they would strike up a conversation and quickly become friends. I know from inside myself that no one on earth has kept me alive and warm during the winter. Aren't there newborns who seem to come into the world with every luxury, and yet they perish despite it all? 
God has kept me alive through every avalanche. God is the only one with eyes, and Satan has a sock drawer filled with blindfolds. And I'm sitting here laughing. God has beckoned me to the back door. He opens it just a crack so I can have a glimpse inside. He's let me in on the beautiful and terrifying joke. Uncivilized by Christopher Warren. This has been a production of The Lurking Press. To find more projects and support the artist, please visit thelurkingpress.com. Thank you for listening.